welcome everybody. So glad to see smiling faces of people I know in the audience and some I don't know, but it's uh, uh, very good to see you here. And for those of you online, welcome as well. Um, we're in beautiful British Columbia, what we now know as British Columbia. And Simon Fraser University is honored to be able to hold our events, our classes and work on the current shared and traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, the tsleil Squamish and Musqueam peoples. Indigenous people throughout BC have witnessed and been severely impacted by climate events, floods, fires, loss of their homes, loss of the habitat surrounding them, loss of livelihoods, loss of communities. This panel, I hope you'll agree by today, is a very small step, but nonetheless a step in hope and in moving forward in identifying what is being done and more importantly, what more can be done here in BC and beyond to increase resilience of all communities, but especially those most vulnerable in our province and in the world. And I'd like to introduce now Jennifer Ditchburn, uh, the president of IRPP. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Nancy, and to the entire team at Simon Fraser University School of Public Policy. It's nice to be here in person. And uh, to the people here in the room, there are many of you, but there are, uh, is a sizable audience online as well that are, are watching this live and will eventually watch it on YouTube as well. We're except exceptionally lucky to have Nancy on the board of directors of the Institute for Research on Public Policy. Nancy is one of the country's foremost economists with a specialty in, in environment and natural resources. In addition to being a professor here, and some of you might uh, know Nancy from class, but she's also co-chair of BC's Climate Solutions Council. And I also want to thank our, our presenting sponsor for five events that we're holding across Canada this year, which is Van City, and uh, to the cooperators and to Universities Canada who are supporting today's event. So um, as Ricardo said on the, at the opening, the RPP is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And uh, with the team, when we were trying to decide how we were going to mark this this year, our mind went directly to the people that we deal with on a daily or a weekly basis, which is uh, Canada's academic community. So we approached nine schools of public policy and public administration and asked them, what do you think should be on the radar of decision makers and policymakers across, the, uh, across Canada, provincially, federally, and so on? Um, and uh, Today, we are going to be talking about climate resilience, um, but there was a kind of a secret motive to asking that question. So we also thought we would take cues from what we heard from the different schools to inform our own research going forward over the next number of years. And there was a side motive as well, which was maybe some students who heard us talk or who we were able to meet uh, over this past year might eventually become IRPP staff. So we can, we can hope. Um, so today's topic on climate resilience is something that just isn't the domain of government and, and researchers at universities, but really part of the decision making that Canadians are making about where they live, how they communicate, um, and also where they work. And I was walking uh, along the waterfront at Cole Harbour today with some friends uh, that live here. Uh, I live in Ottawa and Montreal. And uh, one of my friends said, well, um, climate change put on a trade show in British Columbia in 2021. And unfortunately, now I'm thinking about the, the, um, the, uh, the heat dome and the atmospheric river, but unfortunately that trade show is continuing to go on in BC and across the country in this year and, on, and onward. On this coast, we're facing a drought conditions and forest fires this fall. Uh, tens of thousands of people in Atlantic Canada are still de dealing with the fallout from Hurricane Fiona. Iqaluit had um, an emergency uh, just last month. They declared a local emergency because of a, a lack of water there. So I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, this conversation and learning from it. And I'm going to hand it back to Nancy. Thank you, Jennifer. And uh, we heard a word today at the climate meeting we had that Patrick and I were at. And it's not the climate is changing. The climate has changed. But I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. Uh, to my left is Chad Day, or Chad Day, Chad Park. I'm so sorry, Chad. Today, Chad is Chad Park. Maybe it might have been Chad Day yesterday. Um, but Chad is uh, Vice President, Sustainability and Citizenship at the Cooperators. 
And he is not just a newbie to this field. He has come from a, a long career in sustainability and working for the betterment of society. He was a leadership role in a number of organizations, founding director and lead animator. You've got to tell me what that means. Lead, I mean, it wasn't my drawing skills. It wasn't, okay. <laughs> animating conversations, not animating the, okay, good, um, of the Energy Futures Lab. He was executive director of the Natural Step Canada. And Natural Step, if you don't know, is very engaged in, in community mobilization, holding forum, and doing good things to protect the, and promote uh, natural capital and the natural environment. A founding board member of Future Fit Foundation in the UK, and a board member of Canadian Energy and Climate Nexus. And what he does for his day job now is look at nationwide community investment and partnership programs to embed sustainability principles in all that we do. So thank you very much, Chad, and, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, next to Chad is uh, Patrick Michelle. Patrick is a proud member of the Kanaka Bar Indian Band, and he will tell you where it is, but it's near Lytton. He, it's in the Fraser Canyon, and he's lived there his whole life. Uh, Patrick will tell you what his community has been doing and all of the things that they have been through. He has been living what we're talking about in, in climate impacts. But he's also been honored with his lifelong commitment to both climate uh, resilience and clean energy. He was honored with the Clean Energy BC Lifetime Achievement Award for energy project design. Patrick is a builder and a, and a, and a moving forward and also with the Clean 50 Lifetime Achievement Award for working on climate change awareness and uh, community resilience plan. If you wanna read a great community resilience plan, Kanaka Bar. Just remember that, good for your studies, but also good. There's lots of really interesting thing. And for those of you in the public policy program, he has criteria and measures. So that, that's an in joke for public policy students. Uh, Patrick also lost his home. And in last year's uh, trade show, as uh, Jennifer called it. Uh, not least, but Magda Sapala is Director of Sustainability and Resilience for BC Housing. I have the pleasure of working with Magna on some upcoming exciting uh, events. She's Director of, S of Sustainability and Resilience, and she's part of the strategic leadership in integrating social and environmental policies into the organization's activities. So she's the responsible, the responsible party behind BC Housing's first carbon neutral action report and led its first climate adaptation framework. She's been working on the heat extreme heat response uh, because of course, climate resilience being prepared for this starts where we live in our homes. And if our homes can't protect us, we've got to go to the, the second lines of defense. She's also co-lead for a, for a really interesting online engagement involving people all over the country called Mobilizing Building Adaptation and Resilience, which looks at resilient building designs and, and renovations. So as I said, starting at the home and building up is important to, to everything. So thank you everybody for sharing your time and, and your knowledge and your wisdom as we go forward. So I've told the, the, uh, the panel that I have five questions. And if we're gonna get through all of them, we're going to have to be succinct and focused on these questions. <laughs> uh, but they're, they're big questions and we won't be able to cover the material you know, to, to its justice. We could be here for weeks and still not do everything. But to give you a snapshot from their vantage point of, of what they're seeing in their lines of work, their engagement and their communities. So what does building, question one, climate resilience entail from your vantage point, Chad? Okay, well, I, I, I think of uh, resilience as um, being uh, prepared for, um, able to absorb, and ultimately able to recover from, uh, from shock and, 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 and from, I guess, disaster. And in, in, in this case, um, disaster caused by climate change. So that's the, the that's the way sort of the framework I, I think of it. Um, the, uh, I, I think often there's a discussion about climate mitigation and adaptation and, uh, as if they're, they're two different 
things, and in some ways they are, of course, but um, I actually was at an event uh, that Magda was at too recently, the Livable Cities um, Conference, and heard one speaker talk about how adaptation is, um, or mitigation is action on the hazard, and adaptation is action on the vulnerability. And I think that's a really good way to look at it. Um, they're both uh, required, and ultimately resilience requires us taking action on both of them. Uh, climate resilience, um, let's just put it this way. For 8,000 years, uh, an Indigenous population lived in harmony and relationship with the land based on sustainability. You took what you need, no more. Um, contact came, Simon Fraser, and he introduced uh, a brand new word to my nation, and it's called colonization. Uh, the Intlikatma word is greed. Just kidding. And so we're introduced very quickly to exploitive, extractive, and 150 years we're facing a global existential crisis. All right. So I don't think anybody's going to unlearn colonization slash greed in a short period of time. So as Chad said, so what is mitigation? Mitigation is harm reduction, harm reversal. Mitigation, quit burning fossil fuels. Harm reversal, get the, car, the fossil fuels that we released into the atmosphere back into the ground. So whether it's anthropogenic carbon sequestration to the technologies that are available or plant a bloody tree, or more importantly, quit cutting the damn trees that are left. So that's harm reduction, that's mitigation. Adaption. Adaption is the ability, in my view, to shelter in place during an extreme weather event and pull your head out of your shelter, <laughs> right? And bounce back quickly. So the ability to shelter in place requires four things, or basically three physiological foundations. So everybody knows about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, okay? Well, I don't know about you guys, but it's wrong because first of all, Wi-Fi is missing <laughs> and battery storage. So that's at the bottom, but we'll get to there eventually with another question. Water for ecosystems, for drinking, for fire protection, for irrigation, for energy production, and for sharing for communities without. That's granular. If you don't have water, you're going to die. Without water, there is no economy. Without water, there is no life. So BC, it's not an issue of water scarcity. It's about water storage and releasing it when it's needed. So that's resiliency. You build it in. Okay. After water comes food. Now, if you're eating Fiji apples from Fiji, why aren't you eating meat growing in BC apples? Okay. So there's that element. But we've now created a, a society in British Columbia that is almost 87% dependent on the import for food. Meats, fruits, and vegetables come from across the world. We keep tearing up our farmland and putting housing on it. Housing that floods, burns, blows away, or freezes in the winter. So do have we invested in resilient water, food, and shelter? Look at the other ones. That's, those, those are foundations of life. Systems. Energy, uh, communications, transportation, and waste management. Those are quality of life. As long as you have this, you can have a life and an economy. This, that's bells and whistles. I have an iPhone 7. What do you have? Uh, so I'll, I'll just stop there saying, make the investments in physiological foundations. You'll be okay. So you're the housing. <laughs> He's already maligned housing. So. <laughs> How, how do you follow that act? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to talk specifically to, since you, you phrased the question as, you know, from your vintage point. So I'm going to actually very much focus on that in terms of what it means for BC housing specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe I'll, oops, perhaps this will help. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, uh, just quickly introducing uh, for uh, those people that may not know uh, who BC housing is. So we are a provincial Crown Corporation responsible for affordable housing. And that means the full spectrum of affordable housing from emergency shelters to group homes and um, SROs, low income housing. Not many people realize that we also have a second mandate under the Homeowner Protection Act, and that is to license uh, builders and to provide research and education for residential construction industry. And those two mandates actually work very well together in, in terms of um, putting forward the resiliency and, and sustainability agenda because we're able to use our research uh, powers um, 
uh, through our social housing portfolio and vice versa. So there's, there's nice synergies there. So what does resilience mean for us in our context? Um, first of all, because we are responsible for housing and we know that we have climate crisis, we also have housing crisis. Um, so ensuring that everyone in BC has a home and roof over their heads, and we know that we're not there yet, and that that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, and then uh, secondly, to ensure that that home is safe and healthy. So, um, you know, the experience of the heat dome last year, we did have a situation where there was over 700 people in BC, across BC, that died of, of extreme heat. And there was uh, some people that lived in social housing that died. And so that really, that really shook us up, uh, that real, realization that we might be providing housing, that people, it's not safe for people to stay during the extreme heat events. And so, um, you know, now we're grappling with this question, what does it mean to provide safe and healthy housing? And so we've been updating our building standards and we're looking at incorporating uh, future climate, uh, how, current and future climate um, planning into building design um, and uh, working on, you know, what's protecting our tenants in the immediate future and uh, designing buildings for, uh, for the future um, lifetime, right? The buildings last for 50, 70 years. So, so to ensure that those buildings are um, adequate for what we're facing in terms of extreme weather conditions. Um, and then just thirdly, um, taking on a holistic point of view, like I, you know, what, as I was thinking about some of the questions that uh, might be coming up um, tonight is, um, you know, can, can you have resilient society when you have homelessness? Um, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I personally, I don't think from our vintage point, I don't think you can. I think we need to address the social inequities um, in the same way as, as we try and address um, the, the climate crisis. So I'm going to keep you in the hot seat and say, from again, from your vantage point, what are we missing? What would make your job easier in building climate resilience? So Canada has, you know, we've British Columbia is, is, is a world leader on, on climate policy to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And as Chad said, this is not just about adaptation versus mitigation, it's both. We want efficient buildings that don't need as much fossil fuel dependence, but we haven't really got enough going for us to get to a state where we can say to people, we're, you know, we're, you're as resilient as you can be. So what's missing from your point of view and your vantage point? What would you like to see if you had the wish list uh, for, for BC housing or for housing resilience? Well, I think, you know, there's been a lot of good initiatives and there's been some funding towards sustainability and resilience, but it's hardly enough. I think, I think the, you know, what, what sort of keeps me up at night is, are we doing too little too late? Uh, I think we really need to take an approach the same as for COVID. I mean, it was amazing when the pandemic started, the mobilization of resources and putting in regulation. And really it was a coordinated Canada wide with provincial, you know, specific uh, uh, differences across the provinces, coordinated response. And I think we need the same kind of um, urgency and scale of response for the climate crisis. So, you know, more funding, more regulations, and more coordinated uh, response and, and, and partnerships. Patrick, same question. What do you want in your, your wish list? I want the truth. When I say this, so, so far, is climate change real? In my community and in my family, it's unequivocally yes. We don't give a rat's patooey if it's anthropogenic or natural. It's heating up. And the supercharged heat in our atmosphere and in our oceans and our land is creating extreme weather events. Extreme weather events are heat, wind, rain, and cold. If we're going to be able to shelter in place in shelters that are built, they need to be built to that coat. So two by fours burn. So why are we building houses made out of two by fours? There's a material in the world, for example, that is fireproof, but we won't use it in BC and Canada. There's a material in the world that has zero thermal transfer. 
That means if it's 56 degrees out like it was on June 30th of 2021, it's room temperature inside the wall. That's what thermal transfers are ready. We don't have it in Canada. So if it's cold, out, same thing. So they use the same materials in Siberia. So, so we've got a material in the world that is fireproof, thermal transfer proof, soundproof, mold proof, insect proof, and it costs $140 a square foot. Why aren't you using it? What's the truth? We need to have options. If we're going to be resilient as British Columbians and Canadians, we need to have options. Somebody wants to sell you a product that's basically available at $500 a square foot at the end of Georgia. It's great. You should look it up. Can you afford $500 a square foot? Or can you afford $140 a square foot? Wood's coming in at about $400 a square foot right now. But if you build with it, you know it's going to blow away. So when I say in order for us to be resilient, we need honesty in our government, in our corporations. This material works. You can use it because it's. I'm, I'm going to focus on the shelter component. In order for us to survive, we need shelter that is resilient to extreme heat. So when that extreme event passes, we can come out. Going back to the first question. So I know that you said brevity, but yeah, <laughs> let's just be honest. Climate change is here. We're living it now. I lost my house doing a, on a house fire on June 30th, and I'm going to build back a house that is fireproof. But don't tell the rest of BC and Canada, you can do it too. <laughs> Chad. Um, well, so I'll uh, answer this from the perspective of, uh, well, the starting point being a perspective of uh, an organization that's one of whose line of business is insurance. Cooperators is an insurer, among other financial services. And um, that means that, um, like others in that industry, we are essentially risk experts, uh, understand and, and, and model and ultimately price the risk. And, um, and any, you know, any analysis, any, any degree of risk expertise would, you know, of course, it's really um, easy to understand that the risks are increasing. And therefore, the price of the risk is increasing, which um, a lot of people assume that insurance companies are interested in, in climate change because they want to protect uh, claims. Uh, and that is, to some extent, true, of course, any individual uh, event, catastrophe, costs an insurance company money. But um, what some people don't necessarily know about insur the insurance business is that it's uh, and I've come to learn this now have two years with cooperators, um, is that uh, the business model is that the, the premiums are charged, are reassessed and charged every year, which means um, the, as, the, as the risk goes up, the premium goes up. And so actually insurance companies will probably be fine dis despite the um, growing risk. What will happen is that uh, insurance will become unaffordable. And so we'll get to the point where only the rich can afford insurance. And um, that's the trajectory that we're on. And so um, the, the, what I would like to see is that we don't rely on insurance. I'm saying that as a representative of an insurance company. <laughs> um, we don't rely only on insurance because we will not be able to insure our way to a sustainable future, a resilient future. Um, we need to be investing in the infrastructure and the social infrastructure and so on to um, reduce the risk up front. And that's a whole um, area of, of interest for, for us as an organization because we've committed to impact investing and see kind of investing in resilience as an extension of our, of our impact investment. So um, finding ways to get more investment uh, in, from governments, but also uh, from institutional investors like ourselves into resilience building infrastructure to protect Canadian communities. That's, uh, that's what I'd like to see a lot more of. Thanks, Chad. Meg, you already started by talking about uh, homeless populations, but there are a lot of people, uh, as I said in my, my intro and my acknowledgement, that uh, climate impacts don't happen equally across society. 
And one of the things we're talking about in the policy world is how do we ensure that those least stable, and you, Chad, you've just given an example that if insurance becomes a vehicle only for the very rich, how do we, how do we ensure that as we adopt climate policies, both to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, but also to improve resilience, that we don't leave behind large groups of people? We don't, Magda talked about the over 700 people that died in the heat event. Those are all preventable deaths. Not one of them should have died. What do we do? It's a small question that I'm <laughs> giving them. <laughs> but if we don't think about this and build it into our policies from the beginning, we will fail. We will fail society. So who wants to start that one? <laughs> yeah, I can jump in. Um, you know, when I, when I started learning a little bit more about climate adaptation. And so in the sort of general literature, um, I was reading who is the most vulnerable. And turns out we had the same groups that people that we serve. Uh, so people of low income, people with disabilities, seniors, um, people with uh, mental and physical disabilities and, and health issues and so on. And so, um, that really struck me that, uh, you know, at BC Housing, we serve people who are also uh, most impacted by the climate changes. And that's what we saw in the heat dome as well, uh, in terms of who died. And there was very um, uh, direct correlation in terms of, you know, people that have money go out and buy air conditioners and they are protected. If, uh, uh, you know, that's a sort of a simple example. And people that don't have money, do not buy the air conditioners and are suffering. And the extreme example is to to the point of uh, you know losing losing their life. So, in terms of uh, so we we sort of we you know it's it's a it's a learning journey and and a lot of things um, we know that need to happen and not necessarily, not necessarily happening right now. But uh, you know one example from our work um, we've been working on extreme heat for a few years and we had different communication materials and tips for our tenants how to call off. And, uh, and then um, a couple of years ago, we got feedback from uh, a person with disability saying, you know, a lot of those tips that you're giving out are for people who have uh, no issues with mobility, but someone who has issues with mobility is not able to get to a cooling center, uh, may have other uh, barriers on accessing other resources and so on. So um, I think in terms of how do we address it, uh, we need to uh, speak directly and connect directly with people that we serve and people that we're trying to protect and provide services to. And, and we've only just started on, on that journey. Um, I think really um, uh, looking at lived experience of people and bringing it into our climate adaptation uh, plans, it's, it's, it's key. Um, I think a lot of people who are sort of disadvantaged and who've been historically facing discrimination actually very resourceful. They, they are used to, um, you know, identifying the risk and overcoming the risk. And so bringing in the skills and expertise in that into, into how we respond is, is key. Um, and yeah, just, just recognizing that um, we need to have this sort of equity-centered response to our climate adaptation plan. Which, which would you like to... If, Okay, sure, I'll, I'll go. Um, in terms of the coroner's report from last year's losses, not one politician, not one bureaucrat, or not one SFU uh, academic died. <laughs> so let's look. Who is the most vulnerable? And of course, we throw in this Indigenous lens. We've been dealing with 150 years, so not only we're broken somewhat physically, there's this mental gap too. And if you're not well, so if you look at, we, we travel through life, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And you need to be solid. And so those people who are vulnerable are missing something along the way. Now, I grew up in Maine and Hastings. I left in 1997, and it certainly changed, okay? Do you know when I, how old I was when I found out I was an impoverished Indian? 18. I was eating a T-bone steak with Savon meats, and I was reading an article that said, the lights of the big red W shine down on Skid Row. Oh shit, I'm in the bad part of town. 18 years living there. Second, oh, I'm the impoverished Indian. The question is, 
I don't know why people are most vulnerable, but with support, eye contact, how are you doing? Is there anything I can do for you today? People are not choosing to live on the streets, but there are certainly people who have challenges. So we provide the supports for them. We provide the cooling centers, but if they can't get there. When it comes to the issue of our most vulnerable, they're British Columbians, and our solution is we need to care for them. Can we give them affordable housing? Is it social housing? There's a difference. You guys know the difference, right? Social housing is NIMBY. I don't want that in my house. But affordable housing, that's where people who work at Tim Hortons can live or go to school at SFU, right? Affordability becomes the question. Why are people living on the streets? Because they may not be able to afford to live in the apartments. So the big challenge then is affordability. And we can have affordability built into our infrastructure, but it does require British Columbians to make the space for them. NIMBY is probably our biggest barrier to support for our most vulnerable. And uh, NIMBY, of course, is not my backyard. I want to do the right thing as long as it's not here in my neighborhood. So I don't know how to address NIMBY other than the fact is rural British Columbia is open. And if you're prepared to invest in rural <laughs> British Columbia, remember that plaque in the bottom of the Statue of Liberty? My rent at Kanaka Bar is $400 a month, hydro included for a one bedroom. When you're graduating, <laughs> that's the solution i'm not sure that everybody has uh, thought of but it should be part of the package you know uh, and and patrick not only has housing he has uh work yeah more work than you have workers yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so chad what 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 policies would or policy actions would would you see to to help the, the people you've identified that may not be able to, to do so. And you've already alluded to some of them, but any, any more you'd like to add? Yeah, well, I guess for this question, uh, well, the last one I, I answered with my, uh, the hat of, you know, an insurer or an investor. And this one, I, I'll, I'll, I'll wear my hat. Um, the other hat I get to wear, which is as a, as a cooperative, because uh, some, some people may not know that it's actually in the name, but that uh, <laughs> cooperators is a, is a cooperative or it's essentially a, uh, a co-op of co-ops uh, owned by credit union and co-ops across the country. Um, I say that because this is uh, that whole movement of the co-op sector um, is, is uh, you know, an example of um, uh, a set of organizational philosophy that emerged from meeting unmet needs on a community scale. And certainly cooperatives was founded by, by, um, farmers in rural Saskatchewan who were not able to be, their needs weren't able to be met by the, the regular institutions. And um, so I have that lens when I'm thinking about this. And um, what I was getting at earlier is that, um, you know, there's, there's, if we're only solving the issues or, or, or looking at the issues kind of after the disaster, then, um, then uh, we're really at risk of of of, of making it, making it worse. And uh, when the further upstream and in, into prevention mode we get, uh, the more I think we can um, take a more holistic approach that that actually uh, protects whole communities, um, including and especially uh, with a special attention to the most vulnerable. So I think the kind of thing that Magda was describing about overlaying the 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 social vulnerability analysis with the physical risk, um, you know, will uh, should ultimately end up determining where our priorities are when we're when we're um, prioritizing where our investments should be and and so on. So how do you how do you actually do that? I mean, what would what would be the first step that you would take to actualize that? It is, um, I mean, there's a big part of I think part of this is simple in the sense the, the way Patrick describes it, it's very simple. And then part of it is also complicated at the same time. And um, I know one of the tensions or the complications, I guess, if you just pick flood, for example, Public Safety Canada released a report a couple of weeks ago um, with, their, with their kind of analysis and framework for flood insurance, um, especially for the most uh, at risk. And there's a tension there between um, uh, the, the, 
the need to send the right signals, uh, which, you know, price signals and others about where it is the riskiest to, to live, frankly, um, with uh, the, the, the desire uh, to protect those who are uh, vulnerable in, in, in some of those um, high risk areas. And um, so I, I think it, it's one of these um, complicated issues that no single actor can solve. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, including the federal government and, you know, and, and any, any single actor. So it really is um, the kind of thing that's going to take um, putting the system, uh, it, putting a system lens together, getting the right stakeholders around and on whatever scale it is, whether it's a single community or the country as a whole or somewhere in between, um, you know, just, just having the, the kind of um, uh, framework that Magda was describing for whatever scale we're trying to solve it. So we've had, this, I'm going to go off script so you can uh, answer this one, but we've, and I, I think we've all alluded to it, we've had a, a tradition of reacting after the event. So we compensate people, we try to build back better after, whether it's a pandemic or it's, it's climate change. So taking a proactive stance is obviously better for people because, and communities, because then they won't have as much damage from it. Do you think we're moving in that direction? And that's sort of in the policy side. Are we getting more proactive instead of just, you know, digging, looking at disaster relief and, and looking now at the disasters are going to happen, but how do we make them less of a disaster? I don't think we are. Uh, honestly, I think, um, or at least not nearly as much as we need to. Um, Partners for Action in a group out of University of Waterloo um, released a, a study, a survey they did of Canadians living in high risk flood zones. And 94% um, of Canadians living in high risk flood zones are not aware of the risk that they face. Yeah. So 6% know that they're living in a high risk flood zone. And that's shocking. So too is the fact that that number hasn't changed in five years. It was the same when they did the same survey five years ago. So maybe with you know more of these disasters, maybe people. Are, I, I certainly realized or, or heard with Fiona that um, there was there was more of that kind of like, gee, maybe maybe we 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 need to look into where where the, the highest risks are here and so on. But I, I think we're a long ways from actually um, putting in place policy that's focused on prevention rather than rather than um, disaster relief. Magda or Patrick, do you see anything in that area where we could do better? To, to anticipate rather than compensate or bail out. I mean, it's, it's huge amounts of money. And yet, Patrick and I have heard from our colleagues in the provincial government, they fight for every dollar with Treasury Board to invest in adaptation. They fight for every dollar and there aren't enough dollars going there. So what, what's the gap? Why can't we get people to see invest now and you save 10 times what you would get if if you, your house is gone? I think there's two, like two uh, major barriers to why that's not happening. One is psychological. Like it's very hard for us to think about the future, what might happen in the future and how we can protect ourselves from that. Uh, it, you know, it's easy to be reactive. It's a lot like planning is hard and planning for hazards that even though you know we may have the models and we may even have experience now of, of hazards that we that we've experienced uh it's still difficult i've been working on extreme heat for a few years i mentioned it's really hard to talk to people like about extreme heat in december and january where they they've forgotten like our our memory is just terrible so um so i think there's that sort of aspect to it um, and then the other one is our financial systems and our, our, how, our accounting and our planning that it's so focused on short term. So even though, you know, I don't work for a private uh, organization, I'm working for a, for a government agency, but our planning cycles are so short. So even though we're talking about paybacks and return on investment, that's, you know, that's really good. That's like within 20 years for a building, that's like pretty good good timeline, but it's still really hard to make that argument with the, with the people that are making decisions on the, on the finance that this would be a really good investment today, so you will save money tomorrow. And then I guess the other system would be political, right? Because uh, if you are in a political cycle, again, that's a short cycle. And I think that, that sort of the difference in time scales 
is challenging. Um, so um, yeah, let's change our fiscal frameworks, perhaps. You want to jump in on this one too, Patrick? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You got me going here a little bit. So I have the emotional range of a teaspoon, but my heat's going up. Might be the coffee. All righty. So I'm not one to push books on anybody, but if you want to know why we're not doing what we're doing, you might want to get Tom Rand's book, Waking the Frog. Okay? He takes a multidisciplined look why we won't do what we need to do. Psychological, financial, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. You know what you need to do. You just need to get off your ass and do it. Victoria isn't saving your ass, neither is Vic, uh, uh, Ottawa. So why aren't you? So you can come up with all the goddamn excuses you want. But if you lose your house in a floodplain, don't tell me you didn't know you built in a floodplain. Bullshit. You knew that. You're going to feign that 6%. Oh, I'm one of the 6%. My grandmother, when we were traveling there around uh, at a very young age, she says, do you know they're building in a floodplain? I said, yes. She goes, oh, always into cut my word for it. Stupid. <laughs> First Nations people understood that what you did today determines your tomorrow. So we always invested in your tomorrow today. It's called proactivity, okay? It's not a cost, it's an investment. Change that conversation, yeah. okay? Fiona wiped out all the power lines. Why? Because the wind tore down the trees. Why didn't you bury the power lines? Well, it cost too much. So people in the East Coast are suffering. So the question is, we always try to measure our future in terms of cost, invest. We can, we know what the risks we are all facing. And because we are now living with the impacts, all we can do is reduce the impacts on us now. So that response mode. If you have not burned, if you have not flooded, if you have not blown away and all those other things, you're lucky. Because I wouldn't wish on any of you what I'm going through right now. Right? The uncertainty. 15 months since June 30th of 2021 since I lost my home. And I'm no closer to rebuilding yet. Why? Because the damage was just so damn big. You know, one house we can fix. But an entire community? So what we look at this. So I wanted you guys to have a look at that book because that, that answer is there. All righty. Um, one of those students I spoke to earlier, did I, did I quote Aesop's Fable 373? <laughs> Somebody tell me what Aesop's Fable 373 is. The grasshopper and the ant. The ant gets ready for winter while the grasshopper plays, right? Then somebody mucked with Wikipedia and said, then the ants knock, they knock on the door and the ants let them in. Bullshit, that's 1%. When I grew up, the ant got ready for winter and the grasshopper died. And now somebody from, with that one percentile has now edited Wikipedia and then the ants open up the door for the frolickers. Bullshit. You look after yourself. A stitch in time saves nine. An ounce of prevention equals a pound of cure. We all know it. So do it. Because trust me, we're going to run into financial crises. Victoria or Vancouver or Ottawa or anybody's not going to be able to save you. And I want to take one shot at Chad. I'm an immortal. How much for a life insurance policy? <laughs> Should be zero. I'm building a fireproof home. How much for a fire insurance policy? The problem is the insurance companies have a problem. We're rebuilding back British Columbia and Lytton with the very same material that was lost. So we need to work with the insurance companies to create the new materials that you can use for affordable housing. Houses that stay cool in the summer, regardless of the temperature, so that people are most vulnerable, don't get sick and die. Because it's not just about the air conditioner. People who are low incomes also can't afford the increase in electricity cost. Some people can afford the air conditioner, they can't afford to turn it on. Great. The next question I ask with trepidation uh, because it's, it's kind of a big one and maybe we can unpack it a bit. Um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change who issues reports, which I highly recommend you only read the executive summary because they're like 650 pages long. And the executive summary is only like 30 or 40 pages long. 
but they talk about we really do need fundamental change in, in at least five areas. World energy systems, the way society manages, uses, and safeguards its natural environment, its natural resources, the things Patrick talked about at the very beginning, the things that keep us alive, air, water, land, um, our communities, how our industries function, and how societies function. And I don't want each of you to take all five of those because we, we will be here into the reception. But if, if you want to speak to one of them, you know, what, which one would you pick and, and what would be on your list of how we address these fundamental changes? And we've heard you know, from each of the panelists some ideas about this. But if you could pick one that you'd like to talk about, Chad, which one would it be? Um. Too bad I am going first because I wonder if Patrick's going after me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll. Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to take energy because. Uh, well, I'm from Alberta, so there's one reason. Um, but also, I I worked for five years in the Energy Futures Lab, and this was a social innovation lab focused on energy transition in the province of Alberta. And um, I think the uh, like in the in the big picture, it's actually kind of you know, um, easy to map out what has to happen. It's a transition in our energy system away from um, the high emitting energy sources, fossil fuels and so on to the lower non-emitting energy sources. And in many respects, um, uh, you know, there's all kinds of terrific work on mapping out like at a big picture, what has to happen there. Uh, and, and in many respects, we're kind of well underway now uh, on, that, on that journey. Um, I don't mean, when I say we there, I mean the world. Um, there's a lot of attention to that. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of innovation happening in the in the energy space. There's a lot of um, uh, climate concerned capital, uh, if I can say it like that, um, compared to what there was um, years ago. And so uh, I'm not saying like okay we're done, uh, but it it is it is on its way, and the complexities come. Um, honestly, I think mostly from the politics. Uh, it's it's um, and the bigger, broader context is the 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 polarization we we um, we have in our in our communities in our countries and um, you know Canada and energy and climate is a pretty pretty prominent example of that. So the barriers um, are not really, in my view, technical. Uh, the 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 pace of the transition um, that is to some extent inevitable is really going to be determined by um, by politics by by culture uh, and um, so that's that's uh, maybe not the answer you were looking for but that's kind of what I think of when I having spent a lot of time working on energy transition um, I could maybe tell one one interesting story here. Um, the Energy Futures Lab, when we were first conceiving of it, was um, and we were going around interviewing leaders in the energy industry and government and um, First Nations environmental groups and so on. And there was a lot that they disagreed on, uh, as you can imagine. Um, but there actually was one thing that they all agreed on. Uh, and that one thing was that polarization was getting in the way of them achieving their objectives. Sure whatever the objectives were. Um, and so we actually convened the Energy Futures Lab around that problem. Like, can we find common ground? Can we put the problem of polarization in this, at the center uh, and see if we can create uh, like an innovation space for bringing actors who you might not expect to work together to find some common ground and find some solutions. And I, I mean, I, I guess I'm biased having tried that approach and, and, and watched it work its magic for a few years. Um, but I think we, we need a whole lot more of that. Yeah. And my own view uh, living in Alberta is um, it actually, it, it's, it's, it's not very helpful to, to frame the issues as good guys against bad guys. And because um, most people want to be part of the solution, even in Alberta, I can, I can tell you that. Uh, and, um, and, and, and want to see themselves as part of the solution. So the more we can invite people into the solution space um, and, and try to tackle the polarization head on, I, I feel like that's actually the key to making the kind of change we need to make in the energy systems anyway. 
Thanks. Patrick. Oh, thank you. Um, it may not be one of the top five. Anybody notice what's on my lapel? I'm a British Columbian and I'm a Canadian. The only way we're going to survive the next hundred years is by working together. Whether that's political, whether that's corporate, I value each and every one of you because you have something I need and want. It's you. The only way we're going to prepare ourselves for tomorrow is that we need to take care of business. I'm listening to people say nothing I say or do matters. And yet I was raised that everything you say or do matters. So be careful what you say or do. That means quit dropping <laughs> F-bombs at SFU events. <laughs> Don't think I dropped one, but I'll get Just there if you want to, right? <laughs> but my, my point though is this, each and every one of you are given two gifts, life and choice. Choose your future, get to your MLA, get to your MP, get to your municipal government and demand that we make the positive steps. Politicians need to hear from you. What they're listening to is the ampl amplified angry voice of a guy whose job is on the line. We just lost half of our forestry sector due to wildfire and the loggers are pissed off that they can't log the old growth. So they're, they're amplified. Where are you? You don't have to be angry. You just need to reach out and let the politicians know that you're a British Columbian and you're a Canadian and you care. You care about climate and we want policies and we want programs and we want funding to create the resiliency that my children and grandchildren deserve. Now, I don't know how, you, how many of you have children or grandchildren, but I have six kids and 16 grandchildren. I got 22 reasons to get up in the morning and fight the good fight. And it's not a fight because if you don't have something to believe in why I live, and for all my life, I've believed. My community has no children in care. My community has 100% graduation. My community has 100% employment. We have 100% rent collection and all this other stuff, but we don't have an economy. Get the picture? Simon Fraser introduced colonization, AKA greed, and now we're facing a global existential crisis. If you're prepared to walk away from profits, you should be okay. You want a feature. It didn't mean you were going to get a 23% return on your investment. So are you prepared to ask for the investments today in your future? So it's really your power. Work together because the only way we're going to be okay is that we have to be at this together. The polarization. I know Albertans, they care too, but they're also concerned about their livelihoods. But if their livelihoods are predicated on getting more of the fossil fuels into the atmosphere, then retool them, transition them into carbon sequestration, right? Retool them into manufacturing of the new building materials, retool them into solar installation. Well, I, when I grow up, I want to work in the oil, oil patch. Almost everybody I met in the oil patch hates working at the oil patch in which there is an alternative. And that alternative isn't Walmart or Tim Hortons. I'm saying, so let's find the alternative, the option because we can't continue the norm and the status quo. It's killing us. And there are lots of options for the skill sets that you have in those sectors yeah. in the clean growth, clean tech. You know, you can work on a solar panel with the same skill sets as you had in the oil and gas sector. Not exactly the same skill sets, but many of them are overlapping. Yeah. And where we focus on the, the, the cost without focusing on what do we need to get those people into those sectors. Magda, what do you want to tackle on this? Well, I kind of, well, I want to talk about, you know, again, from our perspective. So in terms of uh, building uh, communities and, and, uh, and, and buildings, but I want to just kind of tag on to what you just were talking. I think the, you know, the capacity building and preparing the workforce for the transition needs to happen yesterday and at scale and i think you know we we just haven't seen that yet so so really uh all of it and you know let's let's do it and do it now um uh, at bc housing we are actually uh, uh I, I mentioned that part of our mandate is to provide research and education for the residential construction industry and so we started integrating sustainability and resilience aspects into that um, this week, we're actually posting first modules, training modules uh, for builders on BC Energy Step Code to really, so not only, you know, so there's a 
regulation coming in in terms of energy efficiency for buildings and we trying to build capacity within the sector so that the builders know actually how to do it and have opportunities to exchange with other uh, uh, peers on best practices and so on so uh, and, and again sort of really ramping that up I think that's what's what's needed um, in terms of uh, you know buildings we we also trying to shift perspective when we think about resiliency from just looking at the building in isolation to looking at a building within the neighborhood and within communities. So what that means is, you know, imagine there is an affordable housing building that's uh, designed to withstand, uh, you know, the earthquake, for example, that we are expecting. We're talking about seismic resilience for a second, uh, as well as the extreme weather and so on. But perhaps it will become a community hub. Maybe it will serve the community uh, uh, as an additional resource. So looking at, you know, what, what are the ways how we can build relationships where, where we have affordable housing. Um, and then the third one is really, again, amplifying the voices of you know, the, who the building is going to be for, bringing those people into our, our design. So we have a few projects that are major redevelopments. And uh, for the first time, we started to invest time and, and, and money into bringing uh, tenant voices into what they need and what sort of building they would like to live in. So just kind of tapping into that equity question earlier. Um, so that's, those are just some of the things that we're doing. So we've heard a lot about issues, a lot about what we can do. Um, we urge all of you to, to think about these things as Patrick challenged you to go out and, and be part of the solution and to hold our governments accountable, uh, to, to be saying to them, this isn't good enough. We've got to do better. And uh, so, you know, walk with your voice too to these sorts of things. And thank you all. You're not done yet though, because we're going to ask the audience, both online and in the room, if they would like to uh, challenge any of the panelists and ask them questions. And I believe we're going to first a question online. Online is very quiet right now. So let's start with the room. Well, what's wrong with online? Are they eating dinner or what? <laughs> Sorry, I spoke too soon. Online is waking up right now. Okay. Jean A. Patterson asks, what material would be ideal for house building? I like brick, but the type of brick is also relevant. We need to lobby for materials research. We've got two experts here. <laughs> All right. So the material, I'm, so I, I did a video on May 27th called The Results Are In. And I'm going to ask uh, Nancy to, to make it available to all the participants. So it's got an extended biograph. There's a video called Lit and Burnt in a, on June 30th. The results are in. And I call it Magnus Opus. I retired as chief uh, shortly after a May 19th incident to look after my family. And But the information I have is online. The results are in. You need to look it up. It's on the Discovery Channel called AAC. It is carbon, low carbon, and it's lighter, and it's pretty much indestructible. So Discovery Channel AAC speaks for itself, right? It is a liquid that expands into a cementitious nature, meets all of code. So used in rebuilding California, Santa Rosa, Paradise Valley, used in Haiti, used in Australia. Why aren't we using it here? It's affordable and it works and it's energy efficient and it's durable. I'm just saying is I'm not here. It's just not here. Is it because it's not licensed or is it's not available? Uh, it's because that it doesn't involve lumber, steel and sub trades. <laughs> it's called vested interest. It's like, why are we building a goddamn pipeline when we're facing a global existential crisis? Anyway, <laughs> Discovery <laughs> Channel AAC YouTube. <laughs> So you not only get the philosophical, you get to know where to, you know, to, to, to buy things and they do exist. And I think that's a really important comment. We are not trying to change people's life. Do you care if the lights are on, you know, that it's coming from a, a solar panel or a wind farm? No, you don't care as long as the lights are on. Chad, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I want to take this opportunity to jump in. It's not the, a direct answer to the question on uh, building, but it's, I think, going to illustrate maybe my earlier point uh, with a little bit of a counterintuitive example. The, 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 the contentious point I will make uh, with this is that um, 
it's possible that uh, the product coming out of the oil sands could be part of a low carbon future. What do you mean? Um, there's, uh, if I'm directing to, directing to, uh, to websites, I'll direct people to um, something called Bitumen Beyond Combustion out of Alberta Innovates. So there, there's a whole research program out of um, Alberta Innovates, which is finding alternative uses for the bitumen instead of burning it, using it in applications that uh, where its carbon density uh, is becomes an asset instead of a liability. So I personally think this is totally fascinating because the resource uh, whose biggest liability is its carbon intensity, um, that becomes a that becomes actually a, an asset. So specifically, carbon fibers is what they're looking at, um, and carbon fibers. Uh, if you could replace certain um, heavier materials with carbon fibers, um, then you in, for example, automobiles or whatever, they, they're much lighter and you could enhance fuel efficiency without combusting the, the bitumen and causing the, um, the increase in emissions. So there, there's a great, uh, if you just Google bitumen beyond combustion in Al Alberta Innovates, you find that, that whole program of research and it's totally counterintuitive um, and kind of fascinating from that perspective. Great. I'm just going to add that I'm going to look up all those uh, great <laughs> alternative products and maybe we'll be doing some pilots on, on that. Uh, but we are looking at uh, what are some low carbon materials and uh, we're starting to look at embodied carbon in our buildings. And so that certainly means shifting away from uh, concrete that's very high carbon intense and looking at alternatives. Uh, there are some projects in BC with um, uh mass timber done with mass timber which which is a new new product uh it's wood <laughs> it's, <wood. laughs> it's, it's very fire uh fireproof i um i don't think we've got any of our own product but uh yeah we're certainly looking into what are some of the alter alternatives so here's you know, the point is if we demand it and if we require that we change the way we're doing things, these products will emerge. I mean, the, the private sector is really good at developing alternatives, not, not because of altruism, but because they provide jobs and incomes for people. But if we can find those alternatives, then we can, we can get there. And they do exist. So what we want to do is reduce the barriers to getting them. The barriers may be, as, as Patrick will tell you, there's nobody producing it locally. And so we can't get it here. Or the barriers may be codes and standards that prevent the use of some things that haven't adapted to our, our new environment. So these are all very positive. And I did see somebody's hand go up in the audience. I think it was you. And if you wouldn't mind sort of going to the, well, we're gonna pass, we're gonna try to get you to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I guess this is for all the panelists, but um, I was curious, um, Chad, you were talking about the Energy Futures Lab and finding common ground and polarization. Um, I'm just curious what, what kind of things came out of that, but I think to all the panelists, I'm, I'm interested in what you see as, as potential common ground. Um, yeah, I think that's enough. I was going to ask about politics too, but <laughs> <laughs> you, you better stop while you're ahead. Yeah. Um, well, what what came out of it? Um, there's it's still happening. Uh, the Energy Futures Lab is still ongoing. Um, the um, there's all kinds of interesting um, innovations that that um, either uh, came out of the lab or were um, maybe existed, but then were cultivated and somehow scaled as a result of the lab. The bitumen beyond combustion work as Alberta Minivates is one example, but um, uh, the, the whole idea of getting lithium um, in Alberta to um, out of wastewater in the, in, in, um, the, the brine in the oil wells, um, so that you, you, you know, as you're, um, you're, you're using the, the old, um, infrastructure of a of the old industry let's say to um, produce the the material that's necessary for the transition uh, in terms of batteries and 
electric vehicles and so on. So that there was a whole uh, initiative that emerged out of the Energy Futures Lab on that. A lot of the, the hydrogen um, uh, work that is now, um, you know, at a very uh, national and provincial scale, a lot of attention on hydrogen. But um, the innovators who were working in that space five or six, seven years ago in the Energy Futures Lab were we're doing pilot projects and so on. So there, and those are just uh, those are just a few. There's there was um, really interesting projects where um, uh, blockchain technology was applied uh, in the context of uh, to help um, uh, rural, uh, mostly farm um, solar uh, installations to aggregate their um, their um, their production in order to be able to get it to a size significant enough to sell the carbon credits in the markets. This was like a an innovation that came from matching like unexpected collaborators. Uh, you know, a tech entrepreneur with the rural um, Equus, the the rural energy cooperative in in Alberta. So those are those are I, I think you know in some ways you never know if you can if you can frame the question and the challenge in the right way and get the right diversity of people around the table, then, then you never know what could come. Um, but some, some of the, the challenge is actually getting people to the table uh, in, a, in, a, in a collaborative mindset because there's much more of an orientation to uh, a, a conflicting mindset, I think, on these issues. Anyone else want to tackle that? I got to get in here. Sitting on my knee is a logo. Okay, you've all seen it. You're probably wondering, okay, what the heck is he going to say about that? It's indigenous people make colonization have incredibly dark history, but incredibly bright future brought about by the renewable energy sector. Our path forward as a community was to go back in sustainable and, and non-extractive economies. So we built our first hydro project. We've now got 15 operating solar projects and two operating wind towers. I can't lost track of how much battery storage we have. With BC Housing, we're putting in a brand new subdivision that is connected to the grid, but also has its own solar and wind with a battery storage. So if the grid goes down, my community stays lit. Do you know what my hydro bill is at my house on June 30th? I put $14,000 in solar in my hydro bill for seven air conditioners was 10 bucks per month. So the question is, solar doesn't work and it doesn't pay for itself. My hydro bill used to be $400 a month, but it was now $10, which is the connection fee. So the payback period was four years on a product that would last 25. So guess what? I was getting payback down the road. But remember, colonization says, if you ain't making profit in the first year, we're not going to do it. The problem with renewable energy is, you're actually betting on a long-term return. If your operating cost is zero, you've actually freed up $400 a month. But the cost of 14,000, but people will tell you in the oil field, solar stinks, wind falls down and hydro, while well, that son of a gun freezes. Oil, now what's worse up? I'm just saying, don't let you guys understand. Renewable energy works, and in order to be resilient, we need smaller scale diversification. So when the grid goes down, your lights can stay on. So that's my imagination. The path forward is smaller scale. Litton is Canada's hotspot. I was the only person who had solar, and it just blew me away. So it works, and everything is online. Um, if you guys want to have a look at it, for those people, 43, 53 minutes of videos, there's 83. Some of my YouTube videos have almost 400 views, but I've been told every time I watch, it counts. <laughs> so please, get my numbers up. <laughs> yes, I'm not sure that that answered your question, but it was a good answer to somebody's question. So... <laughs> Do we have anything from online? Yeah, online is, is still with us. Um, Daniel Lamb, who says, hi, Nancy, hope you're well. Hi, hi Daniel. Uh, says he's working with uh, Environment Canada to help build a federal flood mapping program. And one of the biggest hurdles is actually with homeowners who are afraid that releasing information on floodplain locations will reduce property values. Oh, good question. How do we try to solve this? And I think this this also speaks to someone else's question, which is what would it take for human needs to move ahead of human wants? Good but, question, Daniel. Yeah. We trained you well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for getting us back on to resilience. Uh, um, yeah, I think the 
yeah, I mean, Magda talked about psychology. That's a really interesting psychology uh, analysis. I think there is we don't we don't want to admit that the problem is there because we might um, lose value, uh, even though this is really about our exposure to risk. Um, so um, I, I I just think we need those maps, and and we're you know the 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 community leaders and the politicians and so on need to have the courage to make, uh, you know, we have to deal with the truth, as you said earlier, this is actually the, the risk that we're exposed to. And now let's start talking about this is why we need to invest in, in resilient infrastructure or whatever it is to like protect the value of your home and, and to protect the, um, the bonds of your community and so on. Um, but if we're, if we're pretending that the issue isn't there, it's not it's not really going to help us make the case for, for preventative action. So I, I just think we need, this is a great example of we just need the truth. Magda? Well, I, I, yes, and uh, I think there's been uh, different, uh, I think the city of Vancouver has released a flat plane map and there was the same concerns and worries about uh, releasing them. And then they did and uh, the, the, the fears didn't materialize. So. Um, I think there's also the sort of examination whether the fears are, are well founded. Um, and I agree with Chad. I mean, ultimately, um, if you know what the risk is, you can do something about it and you can make decisions uh, related to that. So um, it might be politically a challenging situation, but uh, like I think it's already been mentioned by, but a, a couple of times on the panel, um, let's not get politics in a way of us uh, you know, securing our own future. Yeah. I could tell an example, actually, just uh, before uh, um, moving on. The the, um, the mayor, former mayor of Edmonton, Don Iveson, is um, is um, he tells the story of uh, of when um, Edmonton uh, was had done all their flood mapping, and they're quite advanced in Edmonton uh, on on that um, on that front, and they um, they. Uh, they had the data and and they were going to release it uh, to the maps and so on to the public, but they they didn't want to do so um, before also having in place all the programming and and uh -huh. and the sort of plan for how we were going to uh, deal with the risk. And so they were they were trying to time the release of these at the same time, and the the, the plan part of it was was a little behind. And um, <laughs> What and, a surprise. Yeah, no, but they, I mean, they got there to their credit, but the, but um, the Edmonton Journal did a, a, a FOIP, uh, Freedom of Information, and got the, the stuff out before the city was ready. Um, and, and so he describes that as like, oh, God, what a headache that was for them. But ultimately, they were able, they were far enough along with the plan to say, yep, it's true. Those are, that's the situation. And uh, and we're, you know, two thirds of the way of getting the plan and you can come and give your input into the plan and so on. So they were able to adapt. But I think the way he described that was that it, um, yeah, it created the, the, the pressure from the community to the council to actually take action Work. on it. Yeah. Ignorance is not, I mean, nobody should hide behind the fact that people may be upset about this because how else do we go forward? Uh, before you go on here, I'm just saying you're, I don't know anything about law or real estate agent, but if you bought your home, sue the realtor and lawyer who, who should have told you. If you've built on a floodplain, you have the right. It's called uh, buyer something. <laughs> they, have, they have an obligation to tell yeah, you, by the right. way, you're building on a, a fault zone or yeah. a fire zone or a yeah. floodplain. Yeah, you have to repeal. So you have recourse that's against nice. the people who sold it. Anybody who purchased the land and built, that's different. But most people buy property. So you may have some recourse against the person who sold it to you because he should have told you. But if he told you and you ignored it, then that's at your risk. But then we now look at, I've heard about relocation programs. Look, every time your house floods, it's gonna cost British Clemens or insurance, uh, the Canadians or insurance companies massive amounts of money. How about I give you half a million dollars, your assessed value, and don't let the door hit you on the way out and we make the house available to the homeless? Probably not. We should probably just destroy it. Yeah. Right. But the point is, you may have to leave because remember, you don't want to be living in a house that is vulnerable to flooding. That's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So one of the things is we built in these places insurance map. Can people in Richmond get flood insurance? From cooperators, they can. 
really <laughs> if you can afford the premium the mortgage is three thousand the premium is five that's right because the risk is high so the point is if you don't think you're in the floodplain, I bet you any much the insurance company knows where the hell your house is because it will be reflected in your insurance premium. So the point is you need to come into the conversation with clean hands. Yeah. If you didn't know, then that's a problem because somebody should have told you. Floodplains will allow you to determine that. You need to know the truth. Don't build in floodplains. Don't live in floodplains because it's not a question of if, it's when. And we also, I mean, there, there's another culpable party here, and that is the local government that allows you to build. It's one thing if you didn't know, and all of a sudden, you know, the river, like in the last events of, of 2021, we have rivers that aren't where they used to be. Uh, but we knew where it was. Why are the government letting you build there? Why are they, let, why are they doing it? There was a question here. We've got right right in front of you right there and uh how are we doing are we getting close to the last question you are the privileged person that gets to ask <laughs> okay um i'm not from canada but i'm going to assume the same principle applies so i'm from jamaica and where i'm from like if say a floodplain like we were saying if the price to live here is lower a lot of low-income people live here because it's easier to survive on right so if this information gets released and the price value goes down people can buy this land for cheaper to live on how do we protect low-income people from these disasters if it's easier for them to live there that's the big question isn't it yeah i, I think that's where um we need the me the preventative measures, the investments in the in the in the infrastructure and social infrastructure to um, to actually reduce the risk, um, depending on what the community is and what the physical risk is there. Um, so yeah, I think I think the um, um, the the it's it's a really well articulated example of why we need the upfront preventative disaster risk re reduction measures, not just the um, insurance after the fact kind of solution. And, and we do have to provide alternatives. So what, what organizations like BC Housing is doing is trying to provide resilient housing for all income levels, not just those who can afford it. So we need a, a fulsome package here. This is not just a climate package. This is a societal package to deal with with many of these issues and the, the basic need in, as Patrick said at the very beginning, is you gotta have a place to live. And so it's 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 policy writ large. Did I steal what you were gonna say? Yeah, <laughs> I did a little bit, uh, uh, but that's exactly it. It's looking at you not know, just building housing, but uh, building housing with full awareness of what the hazards are and then making the right decision so whether that means you know not building or building in a way that uh, will allow the building to withstand the hazard so we we have you know so much data and technology that it's possible to to sort of estimate and to take precaution whether that's you know not putting a mechanical room down in the basement and elevating that so that when the, the water comes comes um you know um the house can function or the, you know there's a multiple of ways how that risk can be mitigated and um and that's what we're trying to do and and uh, we certainly you know it's early days so there's there's certainly a lot of work that needs to be done in order to ensure that every house that we build is resilient to the current and future extreme weather events jennifer i thank you Okay. <laughs> For, um, so Guy shows up and he found an indigenous population in 1492. Okay. What was their hurricane warning system? They had a rock that says when the wind blows run into here. So if you look, the indigenous populations that made up the Caribbeans had a climate change strategy. It's called the built straw homes. And when the storm hit, they ran into the caves. And when the storm passed, they came back out. The problem is we've now built homes that are not resilient to the things and we don't know where the caves are anymore. There's still a sign that's in the rock that says cave this way, <laughs> just so you guys know. Um, so I don't remember the name of the indigenous populations that were there. That product I talked about, AAC, it's been used to rebuild Haiti 
and Florida from the storms. It has the highest wind rating in the world. It has the highest seismic rating in the world, right? Once again, we're not using it, but other people are. So quit building straw and stick homes. Build with this cementitious type material. As somebody said, brick. Brick really works, but it's also a thermal sump. So that means it'll keep the heat in. So there are product, a, a product in the world that's available. It's not a silver bullet. And if you haven't heard of it, it's only been around since 1920. <laughs> so there's just some bad marketing. Is there any, so if you don't want to come work for me, you might want to talk to these people who have these wonder products. You're just terrible at marketing. <laughs> Jennifer. Thank you. I was, I was going to say that um, I learned uh, what an atmospheric river was last year. And, and so I challenge you to look up Derecho, <laughs> which is the bizarre windstorm that we had in the nation's capital. So if you think people in Ottawa are oblivious to <laughs> climate change, they had a, a rude awakening last year when uh, parts of the city were torn up with this, um, this very violent storm. But thank you, Nancy, uh, for being an excellent moderator. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you, Magda. That was a really great conversation. And let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> And um, thank you to everyone at uh, Simon Fraser University School of Public Policy. There's students here and volunteers that help with today's event, really appreciate it. Also to Van City, which is a presenting sponsor of five events that we're doing this fall. And to, to today's sponsors, um, the cooperators in Universities Canada. And if you like the conversation uh, that we had today, we have one last one. It's the, the ninth conversation that we hosted this year, co-hosted this year, and it's on um, energy transitions. It'll be at the University of Calgary's school. Um, thanks, everybody in the room. Take care.